Ladies and gentlemen, Michael J. Thompson, how are you? Glad I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. So uh, I know you because I had you as a professor, William Patterson. Right. Um, but why don't you tell the people who you are? Um, well, my name is Michael Thompson, as you, as you just uh, stated. And uh, yeah, I'm a professor of political theory at William Patterson University. And I work in the history of political thought in particular I study questions of democracy, the crisis of democracy, and also questions about the ideas of justice, freedom, and um, kind of the purposes of political life and, uh, and kind of the purposes of justice to achieve kind of a better life for everybody. That's kind of my orientation. Perfect. And my like teaching, at least, to expose students to the great you know, debates and dialogues about these questions um, that have been going on for thousands of years. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, I was talking to Lawrence Ham. He's, he was running for senator on the primaries against Cory Booker. And I asked him about why things are so divisive right now. And he's been in the civil rights movement since 71. And he was like, things are all, things have always been divisive. And I was thinking about it, like, yeah, like, even if you go back to, like, Confucianism versus Taoism, Taoism was created as a response to Confucianism. So what, what do you think of the divide we have right now? Do you think it's just gonna to continue to get bigger? Do you think it's kind of the same? What do you make of everything? I, I think it depends how you break it down. My view is, you know, you, you should see one central divide that has been emerging in American society in particular, but also in other parts of the industrialized world. Um, and that division is one of wealth and income and property and real social, concrete social power. On the other hand, we're seeing all these kind of fragmented form divisions around class and gender, for example, and ethnicity and identity. So most of us are caught in the questions of um, which division should we focus on? Which is the central kind of division? And I think the real question is knowing that there are these multiple divisions, but also that they're connected. That, in other words, um, that capitalist society fundamentally has to produce divisions within any community. Even if there was no racism, even if there were no issues with gender, or homosexuality or ethnicity, none of these things matter to people. Or if everyone was really identical, but you, had a, but you did have a capitalist economic system, you would still have fundamental divisions within society. And I think the reason is that we're going through what we're seeing now is that the racial divisions in particular are intensifying because you see uh, this intensification of economic and social divisions. People who are on the right, um, people who are on the extreme right, for example, are feeling the same anxieties as people on the left. It's just their ideologies about how they diagnose that division are radically different. So it's a totally different language about what the causes of the tensions that they feel are and what the solution is. Absolutely, and I think Going off of that, it's important that we talk a little bit about critical theory. You wrote uh, The Domestication of Critical Theory. I, I just looked that up uh, the other day. Yeah. I, I bought it because I'm interested in, in this concept because it's becoming very popular. And with a lot of Marxist ideas, I mean, we talked about this in your class, and, and I, you know, I, I just reread the, I read it for the first time. I didn't read it, I'm sorry, when I was in class, but the manifesto. Yeah. And there's definitely been a bastardization of what the revolution is supposed to be. I mean, the, the revolution is supposed to be like a slow build of, you know, push and pull. This is where we're going. And I think a lot of, I think um, people have kind of taken that idea into this like identity politics thing where they're turning it into like a, I, I don't know. Can you, can you like may, maybe explain to me too and the people like what critical theory is supposed to be and Marxist theory and what, pe what it turned into and why people aren't, you know, maybe reading it correctly. So let's start with the, with the, with the basics. Um, Marxism emerges out of the middle of the 19th century. It is a response to the, the new forms of inequality that are emerging 
within industrialized society. Um, but it's a, it's a theory about that diagnoses um, why these conflicts, social conflicts that in the 19th century were very prevalent were occurring. That, uh, and you have to remember something. Marxism, Marx himself, as a thinker, as an as a activist and as a theorist, a philosopher and a journalist, Marx is working off of about a 150 year period in Western political European and America political history where um, overturning of privilege, overturning of hierarchy, overturning of authority and the emergence of democracy were happening. So you have to look at Marxism as part of a wave of social, economic, and political transformation that gave birth to Jefferson, <clears throat> um, the, the Haitian Revolution, uh, even before that, um, to Cromwell and the revolution, uh, the English Civil War, of course, the French Revolution, and later. And all of these, these revolutions and civil wars and movements have in common is the establishment of a republic, of a society where uh, a free community would be established democratically. So Marx is saying, hmm, wait a minute, here's a problem. You thought feudalism was over. You thought you had these two or three barons and landowners uh, and everybody else, and that's over now. It's not. They changed. They became capitalists instead of just owning agricultural land and collecting taxes and rents off of people, now they've done something else. They invented large machines called plants and industrial systems. And they've taken people, instead of enslaving them, they pay them a wage. But they pay them a wage only insofar as it will keep them coming back and keep them buying things, but not enough to have the equal value of that which they produce, which is called exploitation. So now you have a new system, profit, which didn't exist before. Profit off of the production of things and the extraction of profit. And here's the problem that Marx has. Marx argues that, well, you know, this whole thing that capitalism put in motion is wonderful. Technology, communication systems, global trade, you can get all these different wonderful things. This is great. The problem is the benefits of this system go to a minority. And there's no democratic accountability for the people who own the wealth, the capital, and the productive capacities of society. So Marx's idea is really, if you think about it in this way, an attempt to extend democracy beyond only voting um, or parliamentary systems of government and say the society should be thoroughly democratized. We should be able to have democratic accountability over the people who tell us what to eat, what to make, when to work, where to work, how to work. All of it should be democratized and should be accountable to the public interest. This sets off throughout the late 19th century, a series of movements, communist movements, socialist movements, which bleeds into the 20th century. Then you have World War I, World War II, Critical theory emerges out of the 1930s and 1940s because what they see is that Marxism missed something. And what it missed was the assumption that everybody was going to see the world around them as unjust and see the cause of it rationally. And critical theorists say, no, people are duped. People are duped by the radio, by the television, by commercial society. They're duped by the way their sexuality has been transformed. They are being duped. They don't, they don't have the consciousness to make Marx's theory work. And so what critical theory really is, is an exploration of ideology. It's an exploration of false consciousness or the mechanisms and features of false consciousness. So that I see as really important um, because critical theory is more important now than ever. Because critical theory really is trying to understand the ways that um, our psychology and our consciousness 
is being warped by what really is true at a largely administrative, technologically driven society. Thank you. Wow, that was, uh, yeah, that was great. And, and do, you, do you think that if we don't change things, we might be headed for some kind of uh, maybe like some technocratic oligarchy in that sense where things will kind of just grow out of control and because maybe we haven't been critical enough and we haven't had enough democracy where these big companies are just going to kind of take over and they'll be the new kingdoms, as it were. I think you're already there, Glenn. Mm. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Everybody was celebrating uh, the SpaceX sending the ast NASA astronauts into space a few weeks ago. I thought this was absolutely horrible. This was private industry basically saying, we're going to be in space first. We are going to own space, maybe the moon, maybe more. I mean, if you project forward, that's, that's the idea. The idea that we don't have a technologically driven oligarchy, the only thing that hides that from view is that, again, critical theorists would say, people are duped into just the obsession with these devices. It's, it's, it's simply a matter of, I mean, look, when Facebook came out, I remember this. I knew, it what, I knew it for what it was when it came out. I'm like, this is going to be a nightmare. I was like, no, I could connect with my friends. And there were even political theorists I knew that were friends of mine that were working and said, this is a new public sphere. It's going to increase democracy. And I said, that racism is going to get worse. Sexism is going to get worse. You're going to see the underbelly of American culture come out. It's exactly what's happening. Facebook is not interested at all in anything but profit. And these people really, how can it be that, go back to Marx's basic idea. How can it be that one person, one person has the capacity to shape the minds and informational context of billions of people? This is worse than anything that we've seen before. The idea that Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, uh, Google people, whatever they are, that these people do not constitute an oligarchy is absurd. Um, empirically, they are. There's no democratic accountability. People voluntarily give their lives to these people, their information, their, they don't care their privacy, something that used to be held really important in a democratic society, that's gone. And voluntarily, they weren't coerced. It's not totalitarian. So I think we're already there. And I think the same ideas that animated Marx's motivation in 1840, 1848, 1849 to write the manifesto are still the same an animating ideas. There should be nobody in the community that has the ability or the power to shape other people's lives. That should be a basic principle of any democratic community. Yeah, and that, uh, that reminds me a lot of like um, Rousseau, really, uh, where, I mean, uh, I, I don't remember it that thoroughly, but he was very focused on technology, kind of turning people into really like these domesticated animals. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we see this in history with new anthropological and archaeological evidence and stuff like our humans brains pre agriculture used to be 10 times bigger. And we see this with dogs, they're dumber than wolves. So I mean, maybe I mean, I think there's some real, maybe not concrete, but there's some real evidence that we're, we're getting dumber and we're allowing ourselves to become dogs instead of wolves. And not that wolves are a bad thing. But you know what I mean? Like it's the old, you know, the old short story where the wolf meets the dog and the dog's chained up and it's really fat and the wolf's starving and it meets the dog and the dog's like, you know, I have all this food. Why don't you come join me? And the wolf's like, fuck that. You're, yeah. it doesn't look like you're happy. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. But you have to think about this though. American society has been transformed into that kind of culture. One where you don't really want to, um, you don't, You'd rather have all of this affluence than have freedom because freedom is hard. Freedom means sometimes saying no to something that you may find pleasure in. I mean, an example, an example of this. Uh, 
you know, it may be, uh, there's a really interesting idea that comes out of uh, one of the critical theorists, his name was uh, Walter Benjamin. And he has this little essay, it's called uh, Theses on the Philosophy of History. And one of them is this really succinct critical statement. And it says, every document of civilization is at the same time a document of barbarism. I remember the first time I read this and I must have been like 19 or something. And I remember reading this and I'm like, it doesn't make any, this doesn't make any sense. You know, how can the Parthenon document of civilization, how is that barbarism? How is like, you know, the Sistine Chapel document of barbarism? Like how is, it doesn't make any sense, you know? Yeah. When I started thinking about it, I'm like, well, who built the Parthenon? Slaves. Who, you know, oh, have a nice meal in front of me. Some vegetables, maybe a piece of chicken. Where did that come from? Slaughtering of animals. Terrible. Yeah. Every document of civilization is a document of barbarism. What does this mean? It means something that Plato actually talks about in book two of his Republic. Because in book two of the Republic, Socrates is talking about, hey, this is what the just city would look like. Everybody would have what they need. Nobody would need anything. They'd have nuts for, you know, for supper and they'd have like a simple meal with, and for dessert, maybe some little cake with honey and they'd have simple huts to live in and everybody would help each other and everything would be great. And then one of the guys he's talking to says like, I want to live in this kind of, this is, this is a city for pigs. And Socrates was like, oh, oh well, what, what kind of city would you like? He's like, I want restaurants. I want tapestries on the wall. I want like beautiful things, nice tables, silverware, good wine. I want like women. I want, I want, th that's, that's the good city. <laughs> and Socrates says like, if you want these things, then you're going to have to, then other people are going to have to suffer for you to benefit. Mm. If you want easy sex, if you want pleasurable foods, animals, nature, other women, people will have to be suffer for your pleasure. And that idea runs through Plato all the way through Marx, all the way through Walter Benjamin to us now. And I think that choice, the, 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 the little parable that you gave of the wolf who's hungry and the dog who's fat, but he's like chained up, that connects to what Benjamin's talking about because what he's talking about is, you know, freedom may be hard, but most people are seduced. Most people will be seduced into an unjust world because of the pleasures that they receive from it. And that's why capitalism is so difficult to overturn. It was, over, it was easy to overturn a system, a feudal system, because everyone lived like shit. Everybody, right? The king was the only person who lived in yeah. And everyone's like, oh, F this, I don't want this anymore. But in this society, you can have the illusion that everything's great. Cheap food, why? Because you have so much illegal immigration of the people cooking the food in the restaurants before pandemic closed them all. Cheap underwear, cheap this, cheap cell phones, cheap televisions, because they're all made in third world countries where you basically are exploiting cheap labor. And then the idea, the ideology goes, well, no, you're benefiting them because if you, you'd, you'd be taking away a job from these people. I mean, it's all, there's a whole ideological way for you to make yourself feel good about having things you don't need by using nature and other human beings and exploiting them, extracting them, and in the process, destroying them, destroying them. So if you really want to think about like the crises we're talking about, I mean, the environmental crisis is probably at the top because capitalist society, industrialized capitalist society is, and, and is sucking it dry. It's a tap for resources and it's a sink for pollution. And it's a, there's just a limit, a natural limit to, to all of this. You know, um, this kind of brings up something I wanted to talk about too. I, I think like last year around this time, um, you wrote an article called Democracy has a Problem with Science on Salon. That was, that was you, Greg. And is it 
is it like annoying? Is it, is it fresh? I mean, of course it is, but I, you know, I got to ask, is it frustrating to see like a year later to see these problems just exacerbated by so much because of the COVID-19 pandemic? And it's like, I fucking told you so. Like, what the, what the hell? Like, wh why aren't we doing anything about this? Yeah. The idea that it, I love being wrong because my intellectual pessimism is like, if I'm wrong, that's a good thing. Mm. When I'm right, then it's really bad because, you know, I was thinking, and I remember lecturing about this in certain classes years ago. I was like, can you imagine if there was a pandemic in this country? I said, nobody would believe it's true. Everybody would be dying. And I'm like, I can't, and I'm like, I'm, it's, I feel terrible that I even said those things because even though they're not connected now, but you still feel like this is exactly what's happening. Science, as I said in that article, and also uh, a book that I did on anti-science and democracy, science and democracy are linked because your ability to reason through things with other people as a group. Science is not one person. Science is always a collective enterprise. Um, is absolutely crucial to understanding how we as human beings really work. Human beings are group. We are a group species. Our intellectual, our cognitive faculties are all developed through, through group learning. We're raised, by, we're raised in groups. We learn in groups, we work in groups, everything we do is in groups. And science is just a way of making that clear. Science works in groups also. So when I think about it that way, you know, if we just had a bit more science, a bit more ra reason and rationality, a bit more objectivity, a bit less narcissism, then the world would be that much better. Why do you think people are so afraid of being wrong? And like you, I love, I love being wrong. I've been wrong about things today. I have thoughts before coming to this conversation that I think are wrong now, that I'll leave, and I'll probably think again at some point. You know what I mean? Like That's just how people, you're supposed to think. You're supposed to learn and just take in things. Why are we so afraid, maybe especially as Americans, to be wrong? I think everybody is. Because I think one other aspect of being a human being is not just reason, but also emotion. And I think that if you, if you think about what it means to feel secure in the world, that means the beliefs that you have, that you've believed for many, many years, and most people never challenge these beliefs. Most people, when they go to university, you know, if they take a class like mine in political theory, 80, 90% of them, it's just like, whatever, I don't even know who Rousseau was, whatever, I'm out of here. It never, it, it just goes over. There are a few, you're clearly one of them, where it's like, wait a minute, I got to think about this a little more. Something mm -hmm. thought. And you start asking and questioning. But there are, but for most people, that act of questioning is absolutely terrifying because their beliefs are the kind of armor that they've constructed about the world. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, you know, Freud said that we're always in fundamental denial and repression of the knowledge of our death. That we'll do anything to construct a way of not having to face this reality. And in many ways, each one of us as a biological organism with consciousness, which is unique, has this sense. So the beliefs that we adhere to are really there to protect us and make us feel secure, give us some purpose in the world. If I'm a, a woman who gets married and has children and, you know, our family, we own a home and everything seems fine, I don't want anything to question this world anything and i will turn into a rabid maniac to defend this because look what i'll lose i'll lose all of this security i don't care if it's i don't care about truth i need to feel secure and so religion plays this function particularly well but not just religion all forms of beliefs about the world all of them are basically there to basically support the, our existential fear of not existing, that one day we're not going to exist, and it could be tomorrow. 
and that fright, that absolute ontological terror, like Kierkegaard called it, ontological insecurity, that whole idea is the idea that makes us cling to systems of belief, even if there's a rationale that I can propose to you that disproves it. Mm. My mind will refuse to accept it. And even more, I, in my thinking, I will look for things in the world. I will warp facts in the world to make them fit with my belief and attitudinal structure. That's how screwed up it is. Yeah. Science, science is the acid to all of this. It makes us think, you know, I mean, look, every day we even say our language still marks an anti-science bias. We get up in the morning, we say, oh, the sun rose and the sun set. The sun doesn't move. <laughs> we move. Yeah. We still, right? The idea that people would be questioned and people would say like, but that's really, the, you know, it looks like it's moving, but it's not, it's really us. This freaks people out. Not yeah. now as much, but it did when, you know, Copernicus and everyone else did. So, or to question the, the church or to question the mosque or to question uh, whatever your religious belief system is. Um, so one of the reasons I think that people adhere to them is because of a psychological need for existential security. And that is, and when you question it, people's beliefs about race, so whiteness, for example, um, and racism. To be able to say to other people that um, uh, people, many people who are white get very offended about ideas about racism. Once they hear it, they shut down because the idea, the belief is like, this is about you. When really, that's not the way to think. The real way to think is like, how has my society made me think about race? But the idea that I could be wrong or the idea of like, oh, really, it's not the result of race because race doesn't exist, actually. It's really the result of, you know, an apartheid system of housing. It's a result of, of centuries of, you know, exploitation and uh, marginalization of this community. That people just can't help because then it becomes, well, what do you mean? I have what I have because I didn't work. You're saying right. I got off easy. So this obfuscates, this completely warps our ability to actually have a true dialogue about like, wait a minute, are the way we've, the, the, the society we were born into is screwed up. It needs to change. What will that change be? I don't know. It has to be democratically discussed. But that's what I'm saying about critical theory. These are the, the ways that consciousness gets warped by the institutions of society. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, th I think one of the answers to that, to that conundrum is like really just doing kind of what we're doing right here. And like, um, I mean, I'm sure you've been doing your whole career is having conversations with people, like understanding people. You don't have to say that you're wrong every single thing if you don't believe it. Like facts and science are supposed to supersede everything. But, you know, like you said, people are pushing that out of bounds in, in wake of sticking to these, this, uh, this toxic tribalism. And um, mm -hmm. like, I, I hate this term because I think it's kind of like a, and I'm not left or right wing, but I think it's a right wing term, even though I do understand where it comes from, like the, the culture wars where there's like these virtual struggle sessions coming from the left. But then there's also like, you know, you look at it on the right and there's like, um, communications warfare from like far right groups in the, in the Trump administration. And I think, I think with social media and technology, it's, it's warping our ability to even think we can have these conversations without looking at someone else with contempt and hate. And in, in its own way, you know, Marx said that um, the oppressors will eventually be their own doing in, in his own way. But um, I, I think we're kind of becoming our own oppressors in a, in a, in a sorts of way by allowing this to, to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what you said is really important on a couple of levels, especially go back to the beginning of what you were saying. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I read so much, you know, is because I'm always looking for some argument or idea that's going to challenge me. You know, you can't talk to as many people as you can read books. 
Mm. You no, know, and, and the and books are people, people's ideas, just in a box, basically. And if you're not doing that, if you're not looking out for ideas that are going to threaten your ideas, then you're not doing anything. You're not growing as, a, as an individual and you're not reaching your fullest potential. And perhaps most of all, you know, there are better ideas that you can't even think at this moment that you have not thought yet. Mm. You haven't been challenged to do that. Yeah. And that is the problem. It's stasis versus dynamism. And if we had a society where you could debate other people and really talk with other people in a way that was constructive, even if it was heated, that's fine too. It's always going to be dirty and imperfect, you know? But if the principle behind it is like, you know, I may, I may walk out of a debate with someone and say like, okay, this argument really doesn't work. The argument, mm -hmm. now I know. Every time I hear this, now I know. It doesn't make sense. But there's, for every one of those, there could be another 10 that's like, oh, man, thank God I talked to this guy. Yeah. Or well, this woman, because they have a point of view that I couldn't even contemplate. So part of this, when you get really political and tribal, like you said, part of the thing that makes this happen is our moral psychology actually starts to get very simplistic. Everything becomes black and white, Manichaean. So it's like, you're evil and I'm good and I have to just destroy evil, you know? And that's actually the result of the way that me the media has pre-digested information and packaged information to us. I mean, I can't watch Fox News without throwing up most of the time, but I feel the same way usually about MSNBC or certain CNN shows, mm -hmm. it's just too ideological. You're not, you don't have people with different views on. You're not genuinely probing an issue. I'm not learning from this. This media is not meant for that. It, it's meant to make money off of making your mind simpler and making your moral psychology simpler, because then you're always going to come back for more. And that I think. That's a, real, that's a real destruction. And that's something that comes out of, <clears throat> you know, it's really interesting if you know the history of this. Um, the people who invented the home television, everybody thinks it was the Americans. Americans are big on TV. Actually, Americans hated television when it was invented. The television and the radio, right, Americans did like the radio though. But the television <laughs> and the radio were, the mo were pioneered by uh, the Nazis, by the Germans, and they were used to their full by the Nazi party. The idea of putting a television in every home and having a radio meant centralized control over the minds of many. Mm -hmm. And this, it, it, the reason that this is important, actually, is that actually a lot of the critical theorists, when they were living in America, because most of them were Jews, they had to escape Germany, when they came here, um, several of them, one of them was, his name was T.W. Adorno, wrote a series of papers studying television, but also studying um, the radio as a mechanism for fascist propaganda. And the Roosevelt administration, toward the end of World War II, before Roosevelt died, actually saw the danger in this new technology and passed a law called the Fairness Doctrine, and the Fairness Doctrine basically held that any television program that dealt with political affairs by law, by FCC mandate, had to have an opposing view on the, at the same time. You couldn't have one person's political view without exposing someone to an equally equal opposite point of view because they wow. knew what happened because they knew what happened under Nazi Germany that the, that the, that the fascists were able to basically manipulate masses of people. And the, the people who destroyed the fairness doctrine was the Reagan administration in the early 1980s. Mm. They told the FCC to get rid of the fairness doctrine. Then you get Rush Limbaugh coming out. Then you get Fox News about five, about three or four years later. Yeah. Far right wing radio, far right wing radio and far right wing television starts to come out. And now liberal uh, television starts to ape the right.
So now you got MSM, the extreme sometimes. But that's the story. And so in many ways, um, we forget that if you look at the dawning of these technologies in the 1930s, they were mostly pioneered by fascists, by, you know, uh, particularly by the Nazis in Germany. And I think actually Facebook and this other stuff is merely just an extension. Mm. Um, and you can see this, you can see this with what happened in Myanmar, um, that these uh, radical monks were using Facebook to communicate these uh, ethnic genocidal kind of stories, which led to a, a mass genocide actually, in Myanmar against the Rohingya minorities. So this technology enables certain types of, and, and, and you can see this also in Rwanda from the 1990s where the radio was used in that way as a tool for indoctrinating people to go out and kill people from another tribe. It's happening here too. Yeah, um, it, I mean, one of the things that I'm reminded of is, I think it's 1984, where they have to do like the jumping jacks in front of the TV and stuff. Yeah, and it, it's like, yeah, when you have mass media control and like all this money going into it, like I say this like every time I do a podcast, we bring up like the Mercers and the Soroses and the, you know, these people that are funneling money to get their message across. You're not having a dialogue. You're, you're having a monologue given to you. So uh, my question to you is, if we, if we look back at like ancient Greece, you know, the, the, the birthplace of democracy, they were so open to having conversations. Uh, you read those, um, these Socratic dialogues and everyone's just arguing with each other and they're like, all right, you want to go get a beer or like have sex somewhere <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. It's like, how do we, what, you know, thinking of Hegel here, what do we learn from our past? And do you see a path forward where we can have a better conversation with people and not be so divided? You can do it. The Greeks, are always attempting a place in our minds to go. Um, and on the one hand, there's a lot to learn about how to do democracy from the Greeks. There's also a lot to learn about how not, how democracy can really turn into um, a shit show. And I think that one of the things that um, the Romans learned during the, before the imperial system, during the Republican phase of Rome, was that um, you had to not just have conversation, you also had to have institutionalized power, that the people had to have an institutionalized power. So in, in, if you think of the Athenian democracy, the democracy in Athens at its apex, it was a radical democracy. And that means there was no government. There was literally only the citizens. Mm. And there were just them. They would assemble and they would make all the laws. And that was it. They were the courts. There was no separation of a judiciary from legislature, from executive. And at its apex, the people, the demos, they had power. And they couldn't keep it together. They declared war. They bungled the war, uh, the Peloponnesian War. The Romans learned from this in a way and said, okay, if the people are going to have power, that's going to have to be somewhat institutionalized. You're going to have the Senate who are rich people and you're going to have the Tribune. And the Tribune are going to be the plebs. They're going to be the common people. And in a way, that kind of comes down to us in the American system with the House and the Senate, where you have one that's more closer to the people and the other that's a little more elevated. Can you get back to a point, Jefferson thought that cities were gonna be the worst thing for America because no one was gonna be able to have that. You know, the society would be too dense and too large. People wouldn't be able to have that kind of conversational democracy. But, um, but the truth is, I think we can get back to this if we transform the kind of ways that we see what our political life should be about. If we don't learn from the past three years about what po authoritarian populism does, which is basically what the situation we're in right now, the dangers that it poses to society, if we don't learn from that, then we've lost that Republican sentiment. We've lost the sentiment of democracy. So the institutions can still be there, but they'll be, the spirit will not be democratic. And I think this is what Machiavelli talks about 
a lot, which is this idea like it's, it can be impossible for a people if they've lost the norms and the feelings, the sentiments of, dem of dem democratic life. It could be impossible for them to get it back. They could be just ripe for domination, for kings and other authoritarians. I don't think America is in that position yet. Um, I think young people are questioning things, not to the extent that it needs to be, but they're starting to. Yeah. Starting to. And um, to be honest with you, people who read a lot and so et cetera, who have read stuff and are a little older, um, need to enter into an equal conversation with everyone. A democratic personality is important. To be able to approach my students and say, if you have something to say, I gotta listen to you because, again, like I said to you before, it could be something I never, a perspective I never even thought of before. I learn more from teaching than I do from reading. That's de that democracy in action. That's that, and if you have that orientation to the world that you should treat people as ends and not as means, that, you know, humanism matters, that, uh, you know, being good in the world in some basic sense is something that should be important to you. If anybody still has those thoughts, then they're going to be willing and open to talk about ideas and not worry about being wrong. Uh, and then demo and, and it, as long as that spirit's still there, then democracy's embers, you know, have not gone out. I want to put that on the but, but I can tell you one thing. I can tell you one thing. Better get it back fast. Mm. Because the stuff that's going on now, this is no good at all. The left is going toward anarchism. The right is going toward neo-fascism. Yeah. That is exactly where we were in the 1920s. The left was losing its mind. I mean, look, it's great to say, hey, let's experiment with different yeah. ways of living. I think that's, that's, that's cool, you know? Mm, yeah, me too. But, you know, you can't go into a city and say these four blocks are ours. Yeah. You know, call it an autonomous zone and we're going to do it. It's just, it's just like your children at this point. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the imagination has to go away. But yeah. you need to infuse it into our institutions. Why can't you make play more central in schools? Why can't you say, let's move away from, you know, television and, and, and media and get people to like actually do more art and do more creative things, self-expression. Why can't we make those changes in the world that we have? Start with that. Start producing new beings rather than say like, you know, we don't want police anywhere and we're going to run things ourselves, which ended up being a disaster, which I could have, anybody could have predicted who had a brain. And it's like, the left, like I said, the left's not becoming more rational. It's becoming just as irrational as the right is, the far yeah. right. So the extremes, there's an there's a expression in French, it's actually really good, which says the extremes always touch one another. Les extremes se touchent. The extremes always come back in touch with. So the left and the right can go to these extremes, but they always end up become meeting at the same place, you know? So that's my fear, that the left is becoming intolerant, intolerant to dialogue and ideas, that the far left is becoming um, self-righteous in its morality and its political convictions, and that it's becoming fundamentally irrational in terms of its alternatives. Increasingly anarchistic. I mean, movements that disrupt things, I mean, Machiavelli was totally on board with this. It's the only way you get the elites to listen, you start breaking things. I mean, that, that, that exactly, the Itumulti, that goes way back to the Renaissance. So anybody who says these are mobs and this is just a bunch of criminals and this, that's it, they should read their classics because they should mm -hmm. know that that's not how the Romans did things, that's not how the Greeks did things. And that's not how Machiavelli said that republics become democratic. But if your alternative that you're proposing is worse than the cure, just as something that no one's going to sign on to, then you're actually not enhancing democracy. You're making people 
who are on the right look good. Yeah. And it's like, what are you thinking? Similarly, on the far right, you know, I mean, Pizzagate. Do I need? Oh need yeah, I need, I, need I say more? So you, so you've got insanity. There's enough to go around. Yeah. It is and I think this is the this is the this is the project. You know, if I were somebody who were 19, 20, 20, 22 years old, my project would be like saying, look, look, you know, these responses are clearly responding to a real problem that our society has, but these solutions are clearly screwed up. There has to be something based on reason, based on democracy, based on good principles and, 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 and build that. That's the only way forward. Yeah, that was a, uh, you could put it better than I, than I could. Oh, I'm glad we're thinking the same way. <laughs> and look, hey, you know, I, I'm someone who, you know, I told you before we started recording, I was on the alt-right, and then I took your class and learned, like, you know, what communism really is, and, like, actually that, like, all these thinkers actually um, appreciate each other in a way, but they're like, oh, yeah, I get that, but this is what I think, and, like, they right. would, and it's just like, man, if we could get back to that, things would be so good. There's a, um, there's a book I think you'd really love. It's called Civilized to Death by Christopher Ryan. He's like a, mm. he's a, psychologist. He's a psychologist. And um, it, talks, it talks about a lot of what we're talking about right now. And that um, really, we're kind of, we think we're being so progressive, whether we're on the right or the left, because both sides think they're being progressive in their own ways. Um, we're being regressive, because if you go back to like 98% of human history, hunter gatherers were incredibly egalitarian yes. in that like they barely ever raped cases of war were exceptional not in that they were great but in that they rarely happened and there was you know we say greece was the, the you know the founding place of democracy modern democracy maybe yes. but they would talk to each other man woman no matter what and they would decide on things and if you were a piece of shit guess what you're out <laughs> you're not in the yeah. you'll give you another chance maybe because there were really Honestly, like, I think they're maybe, they were, like, above us in, like, a lot of those ways politically. Um, but then something happened, and this is something I really wanted to ask you um, for a while during this podcast as well. Climate change kind of affected things. I mean, we'll, we saw this kind of in, uh, are you familiar with Gobekli Tepe, where that is? Oh, no. Okay, it's, a, um, it's an archaeological discovery. It's, it's in Turkey, and it is oh, the oldest. Oh, Yes. Yeah, I did. Yes. Yes. I read about this in the paper last week. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So that's one of that was a hunter gatherer society 12,000 years ago, early religion, all that. Um, but you know, the thing is climate change forced a lot of the people who lived in that area and like hunter gatherer areas by the water to uh, go to agriculture because agriculture is relatively new for human society. And that agriculture, I mean, he doesn't say this in the book, but I kind of took it this way is capital in its own way and that it it created oppressors and, and oppressees where oh well now i own this you kind of have to do this for me or i'll give you more is it realistically is it even possible that we can we can be a, a just society while agriculture is in existence oh absolutely um you have to think about the good things about hunter-gatherers, but also the bad things. Mm. Um, hunter-gatherer communities, uh, okay, basically, you have to think about, there's three fundamental economic mechanisms that human beings, anthropologically, coming out of economic anthropology, have used. One is called reciprocity. And that means I do something for you, and then you'll do something for me. Maybe not at the same time, but later on. The second one is called redistribution. And that's when we all do a whole bunch of stuff, bring it into a center, and then when we need it, people get what they want or need. The third is a market. And that's when I pay you for what you have right now and you give me that thing for what I have, trade. Societies that can balance those three things properly, I think are perfectly just. Hunter-gatherer societies would have, would have really worked mainly off of reciprocity. They would have hunted for things, gathered things, and they would have treated each other equally because each one had done whatever they contributed to the community. That's great. Problem with hunter-gatherer societies is 
which is why there aren't too many of them anymore, is that it's really, really hard. All you do all day is um, look for nuts, and little rabbits, and whatever else. And it's a lot of work, not a lot of payoff, and you know, you don't live very long. Disease, uh, weather, all these things can affect you. When human beings tra started trans migrating over into uh, sedentary lifestyle, agricultural lifestyles, then reciprocity wasn't as important as redistribution because everybody would, you know, pick all this wheat or grain and bring it into the central location. Uh, maybe it was a king or something, but the king would also be obligated to say, okay, you know, it's winter time now. We're going to start giving out some flour to people. Actually, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire basically lasted as long as it did because of this. They had a basic welfare system that if you didn't have, that you were below a certain amount of income, um, you were, uh, there was a legal term in Latin, it was called, the, you were the people of the grain. And so you qualified for a weekly handout of bread. And that was coming from Egypt. All these uh, grain boats would come from Egypt. And one of the reasons the Roman Empire fell was because the barbarians were able to destroy the, uh, the, the shipping lanes, bringing the mm -hmm. bread to Rome. And there were riots and everything. So that's redistribution. And then there's the market. Our society is fundamentally almost exclusively based on the market. And that's ripping everything to shreds. If it doesn't have a price on it, it's not worth anything. You need to make yourself into an object, a commodity to be bought and sold on a market. Everything. And there's no reciprocity and there's even less redistribution. Sometimes there is, you know, but even that is very insecure. So, I mean, you can see what's happening now in the United States. Um, I think it was Amazon, it's a handful of billionaires actually their wealth went up like five to 15% during the pandemic. Yeah. While well, these people are basically losing their jobs and going broke. That's the opposite of redistribution. There's no reciprocity involved in that. It's all marketing. It's top down marketing. Buy my stuff. I think if a society learned that there were other ways of having interactions with other people for economic purposes, like reciprocity and redistribution, and the market can still play a role. There might be some things like you don't need, but you might want to buy, you know, it's like, maybe I don't like the bread they're handing out. Maybe I want to buy a, you know, buy something that I don't need, but I want that should be there too. But when the idea I think is like, if you look at hunter gatherer, agricultural, and then industrial societies, um, none of them got it really, really right. Totally. Um, maybe the closest we've ever gotten was the welfare system, the welfare state systems like in Germany and in Europe during the 1960s and 70s and 80s, where you really had a mix of market and redistribution. But reciprocity is also important. You know, doing things for other people and not thinking like they're always taking advantage of you, you know. I mean, this kind of way, these kind of norms can really make a society more just. And I, actually, at the end of the day, I think the one thing that makes, to me, when I think about it, if you really boil it all down, any, any kind of, you know, activity, economic activity that really isn't for the common good of everybody, if it's just for me, and Rousseau says this in the Discourse on Inequality, he says, once one person got it into their head, he says, that they wanted enough for two, and found people and got them to work for them so that they could have more than them. That's when inequality begins. And that's what Marx says in the manifesto. But Marx says, he says, I know what you're thinking. You say we don't want private property. You think we don't want private, he's like, no, no, we don't believe in that. We just believe that you shouldn't have property over other people. We don't believe, we believe, right, that you should only have enough property so that you cannot control the labor of other people. What's wrong with that as a principle? I have my house, maybe I have a car, maybe I got some books and stuff. That doesn't give me the power to control other people's labor. 
you could still have things. But it goes back to Plato's idea, sufficiency rather than surplus. For me to have more than what I need means I have to take it from you. And you have to have less than me. You know what 50% of the American population, what its average income is? Median income. Bottom 50%. It's $13,000 a year. Unbelievable. It's absolutely staggering what goes on in this country. And this country is a field day for the wealthy. Pools and pools of cheap labor. And you've got drivers for every one of their kids. You got pool guys to clean the pool. You got people to drive your helicopter for you. Pools of cheap, cheap labor. And there's no way you can live in a society like that. As I said to you before, every document of civilization is a document of barbarism. Every 15 bedroom mansion in Franklin Lakes has to have some barbarism that created it, that sustains it, you know? And I think that's how we have to think. We have to think about new principles about how, what we are willing to tolerate. And we have to explode the idea from our minds that, um, you know, this mythos that's been created about wealth, that these are the creating creative class and these create all these wonderful things. It's all, it's all baloney. All of it. Facebook is not an innovation. It's just a cheap way to make free money. They innovated nothing. Nothing. Uber, these innovations were all made in the 1960s by taxpayers investing in the military industrial complex. You know, GPS, um, rockets, all this stuff was through collective resources uh, in, in the 1960s. And all it is now is used by these people who basically want to market, you know, uh, find cheaper ways to make more money. So, I think we've got to look at the way this has been woven around us. You know, how ideology is not just in our heads anymore. Ideology is now the way you get around. It's an app on your phone. The ideology is now real, physically in front of you. And it's a practice. It's not just an idea anymore. It's a thing I do. And you've got to unlearn the socialization that you've been pushed into. I think that's crucial. Incredibly well put. Um, before I uh, before we sign off here, um, I do want to talk about uh, you and your you know peers, your colleagues as educators. Are you still working without, without contracts? Uh, we did sign a contract last year, but uh, things right now are on hold because of the pandemic and the uh, the economic crisis, basically that New Jersey is going through. So we did, we were able to sign a contract, which I think was, you know, which was good. Which yeah. is great. Um, and I think that's largely due to the new administration, to the uh, Murphy administration. Yeah, he's killing it. Just make pot legal. I don't smoke. Yeah. That much, but make it legal. Come on. Um, <laughs> Professor Thompson, so stay on the line for a minute after we stop recording. But uh, thank you so much. Where can people find you and your work and wherever you want to plug? I, well, can I just say one thing? Um, have a new book out co-edited book. Uh, for those people who are interested in uh, democratic socialism, book just came out about a month ago called An Inheritance for Our Times, The Principles and Politics of Democratic Socialism with OR Books. So please uh, search for it and, um, you know, learn a little more about democratic democracy and socialism. All right. Thanks so much. Everyone else, peace out. Yeah.